This is the Mules Rider Chronicles podcast, episode 9, The Oldest Man in China. Hello out there, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Mules Rider Chronicles podcast. I am Craig Marlette, the Mules Rider, and the stories you will hear on this podcast are from my own journey as I have traversed the planet on my quest for the true meaning of life. Stories many people find either totally outrageous, hard to believe, or both. Today's story involves my first trip into the world of international intrigue when I was mistaken for an American government agent of some sort by a group from Taiwan. As usual, somehow they found me and thought I was the man who could help them in their quest for freedom. So hop up here on my mule and let's get ready for the next story entitled, The Oldest Man in China. Hong Kong is a place where no one sleeps. At any time, on any given day, the streets are filled with people coming and going, like busy little ants on a never-ending feed line to the Queen. The Queen of Hong Kong is industry, and she is happily married to the good King Prosperity. This royal couple keeps the lights on late, and the loyal servants that live in the kingdom know that in the end, what really matters is how much you have left when all the work is done. And so they work, and when they are done with their work, they find other work that will give them what they need to make their future secure and their daily lives full. They are a proud people with a rich heritage to which they can look for wisdom and guidance along the way. We were in our third year in Hong Kong and had actually gotten used to the fast pace of life there. We had recently moved to Lama Island, which was several miles off the coast of Hong Kong proper. We liked it a lot as it gave us the opportunity to afford a freestanding house for about the same price we had been paying for a small flat in Kowloon. We had rented a large three-story home situated only a few hundred feet from the shoreline of the South China Sea. From our rooftop, we could see the big cargo ships that passed by day and night carrying goods to and from every port in the world. American military ships would also pass on their way to Hong Kong to give their men a furlough and make a show of force to anyone who needed to see that. They were impressive, to be sure, and it was easy to see how America had become such a vast superpower in the world with these mighty warships sailing the open seas. We lived in the seaside village of Pat Kok Sun Chun, which was mostly populated by traditional Chinese who could trace their lineage back to the Iron Age. Many of the older men there had been merchant seamen much of their lives, but now they were retired and worked their small plots of land, growing vegetables to take and sell in the markets of Kennedy Town. The younger generation had mostly moved away to find their fortunes in the vast economic machine which was Hong Kong. Joe Lin and I and our four children had come to Asia in 1988 as Christian missionaries, hoping to do our part to spread the good news to the ends of the earth. We knew Hong Kong wasn't the ends of the earth, but it was a lot closer to it than Orlando, Florida, and we figured it was a good place to start from if we were ever going to find it. We had spent the first two years living in Kowloon in a place called Sha Tin, which is in the New Territories. New Territories is a 24-mile-long strip of land that separates Kowloon and Victoria Island from mainland China. For nearly a hundred years, all of this had been leased to the British government. In 1998, the lease ended, and Hong Kong came back under the control of the People's Republic of China, better known to the average American as Communist China. We had lived our first year in a typical high-rise apartment complex named Fuho Fayun. Our 12th floor flat there was about 720 square feet of living space. In Hong Kong, when you are renting a flat, the entire floor space, including the elevators, hallways, and outside window sills, is divided equally by the number of flats on that particular floor. This is how the square footage is measured for pricing. So, in fact, a 720 square foot apartment may actually be about 580 feet of living space. It's quite a remarkable system, but it works. We had four bedrooms that were so small When I disciplined my children, I would tell them, Go to your room and stand up. Why, that's just inhumane. Fu Ho Fayun, like many modern Hong Kong apartment complexes, was designed to be a self-sufficient community. The first three floors of each building were taken up with various shops, restaurants, and service companies. You could buy groceries, take piano lessons, and get haircuts, shoe repair, clothing, newspapers, ballet lessons, and laundry services within the immediate confines of the complex itself. 
This was especially good for my wife during our first year, as she could buy most of her basic supplies without having to go into the city. A trip to the city meant boarding at least three types of transportation. With four young children, Fuho made the challenges of her new life in Asia somewhat easier to handle. After a year there, we moved into a neighboring traditional Chinese village known as Siulek Yun. In this village, there were many houses with three stories each. Our flat was on the second floor, which was actually the third floor, but since they call floor one the ground floor and the next is one, actually two, that makes three, two. Huh? Quite confusing for Americans, but you get used to it once you understand the system. Siulek Yun Village consisted of many smaller courtyard areas, which consisted of privately owned homes or rented flats, all surrounded by a wall and a gate. This provided much more opportunity for privacy and a chance to actually get to know your neighbors. The lady who owned the flat we rented there was named Mrs. Chan. Her husband had recently died of cancer, and she had moved to smaller housing, which allowed her to rent out the flat in order to make extra money. In the hallway near our flat entrance was a large ceramic urn holding some of the ashes from her ancestors. Ancestor worship is the traditional religion of Chinese people, and this is a practice for honoring them and asking for their protection for your home. When we moved to Silek Yun, I decided to hire a live-in Filipino housemaid, or ama, for my wife. In Hong Kong, this is almost a necessity when you have several children, as you must do your grocery shopping daily in the vegetable and fish markets, and you still have to get the children to school and such. Very few people in Hong Kong have private cars, because the transportation system there is so efficient. Still, you usually go from one type of transport to another if you need to make a trip into town. A typical trip to the market could include a taxi, and then boarding a train to catch a small bus, which would take you to the large bus going to the ferry. All quite interesting and inexpensive, but difficult for a woman with small children. I'm getting tired just hearing you tell it. Hence, the maid, whose name was Elsie. Now, our first week with Elsie was just for breaking her in to the Marlette family way. Poor thing. This can be exhausting in itself, as my children could be very inventive when wanting to create diversions, or just have fun. After the first week, though, she seemed to do well. So I decided to take my newly liberated wife out to dinner. When we returned home, Elsie had cleaned the house and informed us that, since she knew neither of us smoked, she had thrown the urn full of cigarette ashes into the toilet. Oops. So much for my landlord's relatives. We spent the rest of the night burning the South China Morning Post newspaper to refill the urn. When we moved to Patcock on Lama Island, we took Elsie with us and also hired an Australian missionary school teacher named Margaret. The large house gave us the room we needed, and we were all one big happy family there. One day, Philip, a young parishioner from our church, phoned to say there was a man from Taiwan who wanted to meet with me. He was reportedly one of the original members of Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang army, and one of the only senior men still alive that had been with Chiang Kai-shek during the revolution. I couldn't imagine why he wanted to meet with me, but always up for an adventure, I decided to go for the meeting. I was to rendezvous with Philip at our church, and then we would join the other man for lunch in Kowloon. When we arrived at the appointed restaurant, there were three men that had come as representatives of the older Taiwanese gentlemen. After exchanging the traditional greetings of folded hands and bows, we sat down to eat. The three men then explained to me that Mr. Chun, the old man, had heard about me and had asked to set up a private meeting where he could explain his situation and try to recruit me to assist with his business, which they would not divulge at the time. He would be there from Taiwan the next day and would like to meet with me in my home to avoid unnecessary public attention. Though I still was not told what the meeting was about, I was assured that this was a venerable Chinese elder and that if I would allow him to visit my home, it would be considered a great honor by the Chinese people of Taiwan. In fact, they told me, Mr. Chun is over 100 years of age. Wow! As they said this, they all leaned forward and whispered. Shh raising the level of mystery by about two notches. It was all very intriguing, and having nothing to lose, since I was not in any way a political figure, I invited them to my home on Lama Island and arranged to meet them at Patcock Pier and escort them to our house. There were three ways to get to Patcock Sunshun. You could take a large ferry boat from Victoria Island to the main village of Yangshuan and then walk about 15 minutes over the mountain to Patcock. You could also catch a kaido, a work boat, which left from Kennedy Town at 7 a.m. and took a half hour to reach our village. 
When the Kaido came to pack cock, it would carry about 50 or so freshly skinned cow hides each morning for delivery to the island tannery, then on to Young Shuan in Hong Kong Island. This Kaido would stop again at Patcock on its way to Kennedy Town daily at noon and return at about 6 p.m. each evening. The third option was to hire a private sampan from Aberdeen Harbor, and this would be about a 45-minute trip costing Hong Kong 150 or about U.S. $18. We would usually take the Kaido, but also use the sampans about twice a week if we came home late at night. Now, by this time, our family had become somewhat of a curiosity to the people of the village. Ah, strange Kaidos, indeed. Unlike most of the foreigners, we tended to get involved with the people and often invited them on a whim to visit our house. Being curious people, they would look into the open windows of our kitchen and we would often ask them inside for tea or chocolates or just for a friendly visit. Our children roamed the island freely and occasionally our next-door neighbor would invite us for dinner or give us fresh vegetables from his garden. The Patcock residents never knew what to expect from us, and we enjoyed not letting them down. On the day of Mr. Chun's arrival, Joe Lynn and Elsie had prepared a typical meal of soup, rice, chicken, beef, and vegetables sufficient for ourselves and the four guests we were expecting. When I went to the pier to meet the Kaido arriving with Mr. Chun, I was surprised to see his entourage had grown by eight people. There were now fourteen, not including my friend Philip, Jan Ikonen, and the guest of honor, Mr. Chun. The older man was taller than most Chinese and very thin. He had long white hair and a matching beard which was sparse and about eight inches in length. It was also clear that the star of the show was quite a bit feebler than I had been led to believe, and there was no way he could walk the distance to my house. I quickly ran back to the house and concocted a makeshift cart for rolling him up the long hill. Onto the cart I tied a Victorian-style dining room chair to hold the honored guest safely while we pushed him through the village. By now there were many villagers who had gathered to see who the new people were and why they were visiting Patcock. The sight of me pushing this very old Chinese man up the hill on a cart was more than their curious minds could ignore, and by the time we made it to the house, the crowd of a dozen or so visitors had grown to include about twenty villagers. As I passed the growing crowd pushing the venerable Chinese elder on my makeshift cart, Several members of his entourage took occasion to remind me that he was over 100 years of age. One by one, they each gave me this information so that by the time we reached the house, his age had increased to about 110. My wife, seeing the crowd now approaching our home, sent Elsie to the village store to get as much rice and packages of ramen noodles as they could muster knowing there wasn't enough food to feed the ever-increasing mob. For sure. Still having no idea why we were there, after exchanging greetings and pleasantries, I asked them to tell me why Mr. Chun had come to see me. Since he didn't speak English and I did not speak Mandarin, the dialect spoken in Taiwan, we worked out a system to include everyone who had come that day. Mr. Chun would speak to his translator, who would then translate to Cantonese, the language of Hong Kong, for the benefit of all the villagers who now had flocked to my home. Philip would then translate the Cantonese into English for my family, and then we would reverse the process if I needed to ask a question or give a response. The story went something like this. Mr. Chun was a revolutionary in China during the 1940s, fighting for the Nationalist Army of Chiang Kai-shek. When Chiang Kai-shek went to Taiwan after the fall of China to Mao Zedong, Mr. Chun had vowed that he would bring China under control of the Kuomintang before he died which by my calculation could be any minute. He had come to Hong Kong with the idea of recruiting followers for a march protesting the communist Chinese government's attempts to annex Taiwan back to the mainland. He had heard that I was an extremely influential American with contacts in Washington and could help rally the government's support for his project. Wow! I listened to all the stories he had to tell about fighting with the Kuomintang and walking with the great leader known as the Rising Sun. In the end, I explained to him that I was just a Christian missionary and had no government contacts other than those available to all American citizens. I also told him my purpose in Hong Kong was not political, to which he just smiled as though he were speaking with a CIA spy. He nodded occasionally like we had some deep secret between us and seemed unable to accept the fact that I had nothing more to offer than the ramen noodles and a friendly visit to Lama Island. During the entire conversation, his friends kept interjecting new information about the old man's age, and by the time they were ready to leave, I think he was closing in on 130. My wife suggested that his age was increasing so fast they might better leave before he passed on and we would need to bury him. 
Knowing we couldn't afford the rice and ramen noodles that would be required for such a large funeral service, I agreed it was probably best to call it a day. In the end, I knew little more about the venerable elder and his friends than I did before we met. I certainly had no idea as to where they got my name or such information about me. After they left, I pulled out my passport to make sure I wasn't really James Bond, but my wife and children assured me that I wasn't him, and I felt better knowing that. I took Mr. Chun and his entourage to the pier just in time to catch the last boat to Hong Kong. By the time they boarded, he was hitting around 150, and I waved goodbye, encouraging them in their efforts to take over China. I never heard from them again. My wife thinks they just wanted lunch, convinced from her previous ten years of marriage to me that a person in need of a handout can find me no matter where I am. The fact that we lived in Asia meant nothing, except that it proved there was a panhandler satellite up there somewhere that kept my global coordinates handy for anyone who might need a meal. We lived in Hong Kong for nearly four years altogether and made many wonderful friends there who are still close to us today. Like Forrest Gump's mother told him, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. It's true. And I like chocolate, so it doesn't bother me, and I don't feel like I need to know everything to enjoy the unique people that cross my path. I'm still looking for the ends of the earth, but my search has taken me around the world and right back home to Florida. Maybe it was here all the time. Maybe the ends of the earth are right next door and we just don't recognize them because they seem so familiar. Maybe the oldest man in China really just wanted to tell someone from another place about what he had lived through and fought for, and what had kept him alive so long, giving meaning and purpose to his life. I was glad to listen that day, and I got a great story for the cost of a few bowls of rice and some ramen noodles. I've told the story to you now, and so Mr. Chun is still alive in our memories. I guess that's the best I can do with the contacts I have. After all, I'm not James Bond. Thanks for listening to my story today. If our Chinese friend is still alive, he is by now well over 300 years old, according to my reckoning. So don't try to look him up and bother him with questions about the validity of the story. I'm sure he needs his rest and is probably taking a nap and contemplating their next attempt to overthrow the homeland. If you like the show, please tell all your friends and invite them to join us on the journey as well. You can find us in the iTunes Store, on Stitcher Radio, TuneIn, YouTube, Facebook, and wherever it is you found me to listen to this story today. So until next time, this is the Mules Writer saying so long.